we don't have time. All right, before we start, who are my FP people in the crowd? Who, do, who does functional programming? A few of you. Who does object-oriented programming? A few of you, okay. So, I was on the internet the other day, because apparently that's a thing you do, and people like to argue on the internet. Did you guys know that? Like, that's not true. Completely Stop surprised me. I think he was arguing with me. Like, we have this big argument about object-oriented, functional programming. Like, it's not the only argument you have. Does anybody remember the whole, I'm not going to tell you what color I think this is, but, you know, the white, gold, or blue, black dress. Does everyone remember this from a few years ago? I was like, ah, everyone differed. And, you know, this made the rounds a few, like, a few weeks ago. Is that a bunny or a bird? And people are like, yeah, you know, I'm not really sure. Like, is it a crow looking up? Is it a rabbit? People like to argue about things. And this is not new on the internet. We've had the bunny duck illusion for like 70, 80 years now. Um, you know, some people will say that's a rabbit, clearly. Some people will say that's a duck. This talk is all about different perspectives. So if the OO people don't get mad at the FP people, FP don't get mad at the OO, your goal is to get mad at me, because I'm going to say some controversial things here. These are my own opinions. You don't have to have them. In fact, I welcome you to question them. You should question everything you hear at a conference. Don't take anything with, for granted. Just always take it with a grain of salt. We're going to start with a pop quiz. That's right. I'm making you do work right away. I want you, I'm going to show some languages up here. I just want people to shout out whether you typically write functional programs with them or object-oriented programs with them. First up, Haskell. Functional. People say functional. Java. Oh, oh. Well. Closure. FP. FP. C++. None of the above, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's what I was saying about Java. Yeah. <laughs> so, what is functional programming? Because I actually disagree with some of your answers. Some people I agree with, but a lot of you I actually disagree with on those answers right there. So I want to dive into what is functional programming. A lot of people, when they hear functional programming, they think, you know what, I have these super robust types, I have monads, I can't talk about FP unless I say the dreaded M word, right? And I have pattern matching. That's the epitome of functional programming for me. And, you know, if we take a look at Haskell, if I wanted to model a game of like Canasta, let's say, it's, that's super nice. Those are algebraic data types called sum types. That's my robust typing at work. I can say a rank is any of these cards, a suit, any of these suits. My card is either a rank and a suit, or a joker, and look, I have a monad in there too, because I have that maybe keyword. I must be a functional programmer at this point. That means that I may have something or it may in fact be empty. And then I can do awesome pattern matching with functions where I say, look, this is a scoring a single card in Canasta. Just, it's really easy to tell what each card score is. You know, a, a three of diamonds is 100 points. Three of hearts is 100 points. Any other three is five points, so on and so forth. That must be what functional programming is all about. Look how nice that is. Also, in contrast, let's see how we do that in C++. Yeah, we see some structs. We see you know, a struct for everything. This looks like your typical C, C++. But wait a minute. This looks like those same algebraic data types that we were doing in Haskell. I have a standard variant here, which is just an algebraic sum type. Uh, and look, I have a standard optional. That's a maybe. It's not quite monadic in C++. It makes me sad. But it's that same sort of idea. We all said C++ was either OO or it depends or none of the above. It's pretty similar for Haskell, in terms of Haskell from a type system, what I can achieve in this example, not in every example. Now, C++ is not a pretty language because this is my pattern match in C++. But the point is, I'm doing pattern matching based on types. If something's a five-point card, a ten-point card, an ace of two, I'm matching on types. I'm achieving that same sort of pattern match. Not as robust in Haskell, as Haskell, not as pretty as Haskell. I concede that point. But if I can do it in C++ like that, is the pattern matching, is the type system really functional programming? I say no. I say those are really nice things to have, and you should use those. I see that more as domain-driven development. I don't see that as the core functional programming. So the next thing people tell me is, yeah, well, I have map, filter, and reduce, and I do collection pipelines. I am a functional programmer. And we're getting closer. We're getting much closer here. Let's take a look at Elixir. So this is a con uh, collection pipeline where you start with a collection of things, a list, a sequence, and it's just a pipeline of transformations you make here. I'm mapping over things. I'm, I'm using map. I've got to be functional at this point. And then I'm doing an X file. This is all quite nice. I'm adding cards, adding bonuses, adding canastas, subtracting penalties, and getting the maximum score of a player. 
let's look at Java. Oh my goodness, Java can do the same thing. This is probably why Brad said, oh, you know, it depends. Because look, I have all these map functions. I have a max function. Does that what makes functional programming? The fact that I can do map filters, reduces, and collection pipelines? Yes, but not for the reason you're thinking of. The reason you're thinking of is because pure composable functions are what enable you to do functional programming. A lot of people conflate those first five and say, I must have those to have functional programming. Functional programming is where your first class objects, or I shouldn't say that, but your first class building blocks are functions, pure composable functions. When I say pure, I mean the output of a function only depends on its input. When I say composable, or it means that functions can be chained together, in some cases higher order functions, which are functions that take other functions as parameters, like map, filter, reduce. So map, filter, and reduce is a symptom of functional programming, but you don't actually have to have a map filter and reduce to say I'm working in a functional programming language. I just have first class building blocks. When I say first class, what I mean is that's almost like the default of what you build a program up of. So I compose them, I write functions. It's right there in the name. So add bonuses, add canasses, add card values. Those are all functions. I, these are higher order functions. I'm passing functions to other functions to achieve my result. That's what I consider functional programming to be. However, when I look at Java, it's the same thing. And oh, it turns out you can actually write functional programming in Java. Maybe not as nicely, maybe not as concisely in other languages, and maybe you have to put in a little more discipline because it's really easy to go grab a singleton in Java or things like that. If you, but you don't have to. You can write functional programming in Java. And some people might be like, no, that is blasphemy. <laughs> Keyboard commander <laughs> vehemently disagrees that Java can be a functional programming language. But the thing is, I'm not saying it always is. I'm saying it can be. So let's look at the other side. What makes object-oriented programming? A lot of people, first thing they say is classes. I have to have classes. Here's some C code. There's not classes in C. And again, C is not the prettiest of code. It's very tough to write meaningful C on a slide. This is the best I could do. I'm sorry for it. But the fact is I have these objects called structs and I have functions operating on those structs. That can be considered object-oriented even though I don't have a class. Some people say, hey, you have to have state if you're doing object-oriented programming. And I'm just gonna cross that one right out. That's a decision of the implementer. That's not a requirement for object-oriented programming. I could make everything const. I could use persistent data structures that are immutable and pass those around where they're sharing internal state. I can do that all in an object-oriented language. So whether I have mutable state or not does not dictate whether I'm in an object-oriented language. Anyone who has gotten a CS degree will probably like say, well, what's these things? Inheritance, these three things. Inheritance, polymorphism, and encapsulation. Let's level set on what those mean. Inheritance, that's the ability to create subtypes. It actually, for object-oriented, programs, you don't have to inherit from something the traditional way you think of. Think of like JavaScript's prototype-based inheritance. It's not necessarily like a is a, it's like a is a clone of. You don't really have that class template that you might think. I know in later versions of JavaScript we've started adopting that. But the older versions still could write object-oriented code. There's polymorphism, which is the ability for entities to adhere to some sort of common interface. And when I say interface, I don't mean the Java this is a pure abstract virtual, every function is, you know, has no body and that sort of thing. I mean, there's a common set of behaviors that I'm expecting when I interact with this object. And then there's encapsulation. Data and functions that operate on that data are grouped together and invariants are preserved. Invariant is one of the most important words to me in object-oriented programming. What an invariant means is for some piece of your code, something, some precondition is true, and that condition is true through the lifetime of your object. If you have a sorted list, and its invariant is I maintain sorted order, when I add elements into a list, it returns elements in that order. That is an invariant. It must always be true in your program. You have them all over, and it helps you reason about code. So inheritance, polymorphism, encapsulation, I'm going to call that subtyping, interfaces, and structural grouping and invariants. I'm going to use those words because I feel like a lot of times we hone in on implementation details like how Java does it or how C++ does it and really step away from the core concepts. And I'm actually going to take subtyping out of that because I feel like subtyping is an interface. It's a set of common behaviors that a base class has. So I'm going to distill object-oriented code down even further to I have some interfaces, I have some structural grouping and invariants. 
Object oriented are first class building blocks. I'm going to say first class again because this is what's primarily supporting the language. It's where you have objects which are just data and functions that operate on that data. They preserve invariants, so there are certain things that you might care about that always must be true in your program. And they're often composed of other objects. If you remember the functional programming slide like this, a lot of the words are the same. That's going to be the key of this talk. I want to start bridging the gap, start crossing that great divide that we have with functional programming, object orientedness. Are there any computer science professors in here? Because they might look like this after I just said, hey, I just threw out that whole entire first semester of what you think OO is. And I'm going to challenge that because you might say, well, Pat, you're just some random guy. I don't even know you for most of it. How, why should I believe you? I want to take a look at what Alan Kay says about object orientedness. Does anyone know the name of Alan Kay? A few people. Keep the secret for a bit. He says, I'm not against types, but I don't know of any type systems that aren't a complete pain, so I still like dynamic typing. This is him talking about object oriented programming. Think about object oriented programs that have a dynamic type system. And it's normally not something that first comes to mind. He then says, object oriented programming to me only means messaging. Local retention and protection and hiding of state process, which means if I do have mutable state, I don't share it with the world. I hold it close to me and no one can access that. I only communicate through messaging and copying. He wants extreme late binding of all things. That means that, hey, if I use B, when I'm being compiled, I don't need B to be there. I'm just going to send a message out into the void and hope something that looks like a B picks it up. Alan Kay also says, I was too blithe about the term back in the 60s. I should have chosen something like message-oriented. That definitely would have changed how we teach object-oriented later on in college and throughout our careers. Alan Kay says, I made up the term object-oriented and I can tell you I did not have C++ in mind. It's kind of funny that a lot of our like, OO programs in college are like, like, we're gonna learn through C++. And so if those of you who don't know who Alan Kay is, he's the inventor of Smalltalk and the father of object-oriented programming. The father of object-oriented programming is saying, hey, C++ is not object-oriented. I want messaging, I want you know, very, very limited mutable state, only that my own entity knows. And you start getting into like a picture like this where I have separate entities that are communicating across the messages. Maybe I want to swap out this blue box with the green box and hey, because it's messaging, I don't have to recompile anything. It's all late bind or late bound. I don't actually know the past tense of late binding. Uh, it does late binding. I can swap things out, hot swap one. For those of you who can recognize patterns and maybe have a little experience in the industry, they're like, hey, this sounds like the actor model, where I have independent actors that are messaging back and forth. You know, I can hot swap things. Anyone who's ever played with Erlang and Elixir have hot swapped like the heck out of their individual actors, I'm sure. That's a common pattern. I can write these actors in a functional programming paradigm and it can still be object oriented. That's kind of weird. Or if you prefer, if you uh, prefer a different picture. What about microservices? Who here has heard of microservices? They're all the rage in the past five or six years, right? Microservices are individual entities that have local, you know, they might have mutable state, but it's uh, local to that microservice. They communicate over messaging, and there's late binding. You can swap them out. You don't have to say, my microservice depends on this microservice. I just depend on some message interface. Interfaces and invariants. That's what OO is all about. And so when I start saying this, I want you to think about how can I start melding these ideas together? Uh, I'm actually going to remove structural grouping from here because that's just how you organize your source code. And I really don't feel like that's part of what makes something object oriented. There's a lot of talk of like, do, does the function that operates on that class, does it have to be in the class definition or can it be mixed in somehow? So I'm not going to talk about structural grouping. Really, I'm talking about interfaces and invariants when I talk about object oriented. Keep that in mind. A quick note about state, just for people who do FP in here. Um, I have a line in closure up here that sums up the numbers one through five. I have uh, three lines in Python. Which one of these have mutable state? Does everyone know what I mean when I say mutable state? There's state that is changing throughout the lifetime of the program. Probably both of them somehow. Both of them at some level. That's what I was hoping you said. Most people point to the Python ones like, well, you have a variable that's obviously mutating. You have mutable state in your closure example. You just don't manage it as a program. The value is going to change on that stack, especially if you have tail call optimization. You might have changing values along the way. 
So I want you to think, when I say state, I don't mean developer managed state. I just mean there might be a mutable state in your system. And when we start talking about design patterns or object-oriented principles that start to tackle state, don't dismiss them just because you're doing functional programming and that you don't have to manage state. There still might be state in your system. It might just be in a database or it might be in a different microservice. You should still limit your shared mutable state. And that's true at the architectural level. If you're an FP, if you're in OO, that's something that hopefully we can all agree on. The first part of crossing a divide is finding a compromise. Can we all agree we want to limit shared mutable state? Yeah. All right. I'm going to assert the difference between functional programming and object-oriented in their truest forms are about the first class building blocks. Now, yes, there are some disciplines. I'm not saying they are the exact same. Instead, I feel like there are two different sides of the same coin. They try to achieve very similar things the way they were intended. And some FP will do some things better than OO. OO will do some things better than FP. But we're trying to kind of get at the same thing. Another note, um, anyone who's seen this, I consider these two statements to be absolutely equivalent. Um, if I have f of a x y z or a dot f of x y z, I mean in Python we have the self, the, the self uh, variable which kind of functions as that. And like C++, if you do a dot f, it's actually going to change it to that top one before it, like it's part of the compile process. It pushes a onto the stack before you pushes the rest of those arguments. So those are kind of equivalent in my mind. It, so when you think about that, like you might say, hey, I can't do this bottom one in functional programming. Well, if the object you're operating on is the first argument, like the top, you can. And so let's start like, merging FP and OO ideas. Remember, this is all about different perspectives. Is it a duck? Is it a rabbit? Is it FP? Is it OO? I don't really care. I feel like there's this little holy war. So for those of you who can't read, there's a two sides of the duck rabbit, uh, way the band says, there could be no peace until they renounce their rabbit god and accept our duck god. This is what a lot of the FP versus OO wars I feel like feel to me. We're trying to solve the same problems. We agree on certain principles. Let's stop warring with each other and instead learn from each other. I want to cross-pollinate between the two groups. When I learned functional programming, I became a better OO developer. There were a lot of ideals that I learned from FP. You know, immutability is very, very nice. You know, me the messaging, uh, monadic types, all that sort of stuff. I'm going to take this talk and say, well, what can we learn from OO and apply that to FP? What ideas are out there? So the first thing people think of is solid design principles when we talk about OO. And a lot of people think a whole mess of UML, a whole lot like, I don't need that for functional programming. That's clearly an OO thing. And I'm going to challenge that. Here are the solid design principles, single responsibility, open close, list call substitution, Interface segregation and dependency inversion principle. Anyone here familiar with the solid design principles? A few people. So how do we apply those to FP? Well, single responsibility principle. I like to talk about that. I also call this the Highlander principle, because when you're talking about responsibilities, there may only be one. So what does it mean to have a single responsibility? It means there's typically one concrete reason I should need to change. That applies to your application as a whole, your package, your module, your function. Nothing about state, nothing about you know, classes. It's all about why am I trying to change my code? Hopefully there's one reason per logical unit. So I have some Elixir code up here. It's get first matching person. It's given a sequence of people. It's finding someone named Patrick. If it doesn't, it defaults to nobody. It creates a full name from the object that's returned. I shouldn't say object because I'm an Elixir. It's a dictionary or whatever they call a mapping. Anyone know? I don't remember off the top of my head. No, I'm just going to call whatever I want then. Um, and then it returns a person, their full name, and looks up an ID. There's like five or six responsibilities this one little function has. It has to find the person. It's in charge of what the default is when, when you don't find the person. It does your name concatenation, and it also defaults there. And then there's doing an ID lookup. Now, that might be okay, but depending on the context of your program, the more people who are depending on this function well, if one, one person says, you know, I really need the default to be, you know, anonymous, if they make that change, they're now affecting everyone who's involved on that as well. And so the consumers of this function can, are very, very sensitive to changes being made in this function. If you're changing it, if you have only one reason to change the function, presumably all consumers of that function agree on that change. If not, you should rethink your responsibilities. 
It's also the open close principle. This one took me a little while to get as I was learning it um, a few years back. Uh, this isn't the open close principle, I just really like this diff, and I need a water break. When your integration tests fail. Um, so open close principle means that I should be open to extension, but closed to modification. This is again talking about why I should change code. I don't want to have to go modify code again and again and again because I may break people who are using it. Instead, I'd rather extend my code. So I have a pizza maker here, again, some Elixir code. I chose Elixir just because I like the language and I feel like it's well suited for pseudocode type applications. I have a pizza maker and I just have an if check here, you know, if I'm trying to make an Italian pizza, take the dough, roll it flat, add tomatoes, mozzarella, basil, and bake it for 600 degrees in 10 minutes. I don't make pizzas, so if that burns your pizza dirt, press I'm sorry. Uh, the other is a Chicago style. You know, I take dough, I deep dishify that pizza, I add the mozzarella because the cheese goes on the bottom in the deep dish, I add tomatoes and I bake it for 30 minutes at 40, 100 degrees, whatever. This is not closed for modification. If I have another pizza type, maybe, you know, the Italian like white pizzas or maybe some crazy Korean pizza, I have to go touch this code, which means I might potentially have adverse effects on my Italian or my Chicago, especially as I try to refactor within that code. I want to make this code closed for modification, but still be able to extend it. What if I did this? What if I passed in a pizza recipe, and my function always looked like this. I take dough, I rely on the pizza recipe to prepare the dough, to add the toppings, and also give me the temperature and the top. So what's happening here is I can now start passing in whatever pizza I want. And this, this function doesn't have to change ever again, unless you're doing something drastic like adding toppings on after you cook. But that still limits the exposure to everyone who's using you. Like, if I wanted to put an add post toppings, well, if people aren't just implementing it, no post toppings are added. But I can inject my behavior in here just by passing in different data. In fact, I'm putting separation between data and behavior. And those of you who've been doing FP long enough, you typically strive for this, where your data is in one place and your behavior is in another place. Well, that's all the open close principle hard at work. All right, let's call it substitution principle. Let's keep moving on. This is the worst slide of my talk. At least I think it is. You might be like, oh, talk's terrible. I don't know. If S is a subtype of T, then objects of type T may be replaced with objects of type S without altering any of the desirable properties of the program. Blah, 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 math, math, math. Let's break that down a little bit. Is a square a rectangle? This is my question to you guys. Is a square a rectangle? Yes. yes. I mean, this isn't a hard question. We learned this in general. Like, you don't need big brain math to be like, is a square a rectangle? Here, I have a rectangle here. It takes a height width, sets up a mapping between those. A square takes a side length, same thing. I can define an area function. I can define a perimeter function. And for all intents and purposes here, a square is a rectangle. It's what we learn in geometry. I'm going to just read this again, but I'm going to substitute in the words square and rectangle. If a square is a subtype of a rectangle, then objects of type, rec or objects of type rectangle may be replaced by squares without altering any of the desirable properties of the program. Any of the desirable properties of the program. If I had code like this that expects rectangles that set the width of a rectangle, stretch it out, and return a new rectangle, if I pass a square into this, it is no longer a square. That breaks invariance. That whole entire invariant word that I talk about oh, oh, matters in functional programming as well. And what this means, where this can break, is you might say, hey, I'm going to start passing squares everywhere where I pass a rectangle, because they're the same. And then anything that's depending on a rectangle to behave like a rectangle, or anything that's expecting a square to behave like a square, breaks. A square is not always a rectangle when we talk about type theory because it does not have all the intrinsic properties of a rectangle. Namely, can I change one dimension without changing the other? If you do, you just get a new rectangle. If I change this so that, hey, you know, I will handle this with a square so that whenever I set the width, I also set the height. Well, that works for squares, but that breaks anybody who's expecting a rectangle. Because if anyone say, hey, I expect to be able to set a width and the height doesn't change, and if I pass in a square, I break that contract. This called substitution principle is all about the contracts that you have in code. Doesn't, I say type, subtype, that does not mean class, subclass. It can, because that's an is a relationship. But there's far more is a relationships throughout all of your code. And remember, a function is a type too. If you're passing a function into another function, 
and you decide, hey, I'm going to you know, pass in another function that replaces that function, it better match that contract pretty well. Otherwise, you want to do really weird edge cases like this. These are really hard to, to pin down. I've been bitten by them a lot. Uh, excuse me, I encourage you to look at the Liskov substitution principle much further in depth. It took me a few times to really get through it, but the is a relationships you have in your head might not be reflected in code. All right, interface segregation principle. No client should depend on methods it does not use. And so we're talking dependencies now. Actually, most of these we're talking about dependencies. Uh, I'm going to take a step higher and talk about architecture. If we take a look back at like an actor system, even though each individual piece might be functional, might be a functional program, uh, you know, it's in Lisp, it's in Clojure, it's in Elixir, Haskell, Scala, F sharp, I don't really care. There's still this interaction between all of them that we have to be aware of when we develop software. So when I'm doing interface segregation principle, I may not want to jam all of my interfaces into one actor and have everything talk to that one god actor right there. I might want to split those interfaces up. That way, when I have to substitute things, I'm only substituting small little slices along the way. Finally, in solid, we have dependency inversion principles. So dependency inversion principles. High level code should not depend on low level code, but instead, abstractions. And low level code should depend on abstractions. Now show a slide that, in my opinion, or why low level gets a bad rep. Once everyone sees some UML, they go, nope, not looking at that. I don't care what way the arrows are going. And I don't blame you some of the time. And what dependency inversion principle says is, you know, normally you have a policy layer, business logic, that depends on some mechanism, some um, way of interacting with your system. That depends on utility layer. But if you chain that in just a linear chain, well, when that bottom utility layer has to change, it ripples up through the system because, you know, if you have direct call chains, even in a functional programming language, you're typically at the mercy of whatever you're calling down to. What dependency interface, dependency inversion principle says is, hey, let's depend on an interface instead. So the policy layer depends on a policy interface, and the mechanism layer depends on a policy interface as well to communicate between those. So it's, we're talking about interfaces, or as a, you know, we, um, just a common set of behaviors in the LO world. If you go back to microservices, we have this all the time. Like we don't want our microservices depending directly on into things. We put up APIs in front of those for a reason, and we have both the thing talking to it depend on the API and the thing implementing it depend on the API. We do dependency inversion principle all the time. I'm giving a very high level view of all these things. My point for all this, the takeaway, is even if you do functional programming, these are still worth learning because you still have to deal with the problems they address, mainly dependencies. A lot of the solid design, design principles focus on how does code depend on other code, how do I maintain that code, and how do I limit the changes I make so that when I make a change that doesn't have to ripple through my code base what we call shotgun surgery. Everybody solid so far? Anyone have any questions? No? Okay. No one's walked out yet. I'll take that as a good sign. And no one's asleep yet. Also a good <coughs> sign. So now we're going to talk about patterns. Design patterns. I'm not going to talk about all of them. But I think design patterns are really, really important. Especially in like a typical OO language. Peter Norvig found that 16 out of 23 gang of four patterns are useless or trivial in Lisp and Dylan. So in a functional programming language, he found that almost two-thirds of the, the classic design patterns that were immortalized in the gang of four book in the late 80s, I think it was, I don't know when it was published, is you know, useless or trivial in Lisp, or and he had a language called Dylan that he favored. It, are they worth learning, especially in a functional programming context? I'm going to say yes. Just because they're trivial or useless to implement in like a uh, language doesn't mean you still have to, or doesn't mean you can ignore the problems that they are trying to solve. There are many problems that exist in functional programming languages that a lot of people say don't recognize that this is where a design pattern is helpful. I am not saying take the implementation of design patterns. I don't want to see the typical like Java adapter factory interface singleton like littered through functional code bases. That's not what I'm saying. There's ways to adapt them. So don't implement them verbatim. Ask yourself, 
what is the intent of implementing this design pattern and can I translate that to a functional world? So I'm going to talk about the template design pattern. Again, this is another ugly blob of UML that's not particularly helpful. What the template pattern is aiming to solve is, hey, if I have a whole lot of steps that I want to do, think of like an algorithm, and I have this, you know, if I'm this, do it this way, if I'm this, do it this way, if I'm the third thing, do it this way. I want to create some sort of template that I can inject data into. That's what the template method pattern is trying to solve, is how do I get it so that I can separate that data and behavior? And we've seen this already, it's the pizza maker. I showed you a design pattern and you didn't even know it, did you? In a functional programming language. It's a template method pattern at work. Template method pattern helps with the open closed principle. How about the observer pattern? Well, the observer pattern is pretty heavy on like state. Like I have to keep track of observers. I publish some event and observers have to go um, get notified of that event. And at the local code level, eh, maybe not that interesting. But at the architectural level, who here does anything with like pub sub type things? Pub. Like, all the clouds have them. You, you know, there's technically even like if this and that is like a pub sub when you get down to it. Just because you don't have to deal with these design patterns at the code level doesn't mean you don't, you can ignore them at the architectural level. It might be that, you know, very good idea. So pub sub observer pattern, it's there so that my publisher does not need to know what my, who my subscribers are and my subscribers don't really care who's publishing to them. Um, or if you want to talk about observers and observables, I like the publish subscriber terminology a little bit more. That's just a useful thing to manage dependencies. Again, we're talking dependencies here, not state, not classes. How do I manage dependencies about two things that shouldn't know about each other? How do I decouple that? Well, PubSub is the observer pattern at its essence. All right, what about the singleton design pattern? Who knows how we can fix it, have this in functional programming? Yeah, I don't either, it's probably trash. I don't like the singleton design pattern. There's like a 1% use case where I can kind of say, yeah, that's useful. But I really, it's really when it's like immutable and it's like a registry of like static values. If it's shared mutable state, throw it in the trash, whether I'm an OO or FP. Limit your shared mutable state. I can't say that enough. I don't care what you program in. All right, builder pattern. So builder pattern is a type of a creational design pattern. Creational design patterns are how I create objects or create information. There implies some mutability to that, but there doesn't have to be. I wrote a function, let's pretend this is you know, Elixir or whatever, and I'm creating a conference. I'm gonna ask you some questions about this API. If you were to just see this in the code base, these are the questions I hope you would ask. What does 200 mean? What does 190 mean? How can I tell who my keynote is, given this information? I mean, we all know that it was Sarah and not me, but that's because we were here. If you just saw this in a code base, would you be able to tell who the keynote is? What is that nil? What, what is that argument? What's that empty list? How can I be sure that like catered and Wi-Fi password aren't actually reversed? Like, this is a problem with all the functions you write. And like the late great Alan Perlis, he said, if you have 10 arguments to a function, you probably missed some. There's, you don't want to see a whole lot of functions. There are a lot of arguments in your function. The builder pattern says, well, how do I simplify that for building things? And look here, this is Elixir code again. I say, this is very clear of what I'm creating. I think everyone's like, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. It's really easy to see whether I'm messing something up or not. Those nil and empty lists, I just omit them. I'm assuming they're defaults. I couldn't do that here because they were in the middle of the function. No one wants to deal with default arguments in the middle of the function. But here, yeah, look, I have catering, I have a Wi-Fi setting, um, you can see the speaker versus the keynote. That's the builder pattern. That is an object-oriented design pattern, and it is useful for functional programming because the problem it solves is orthogonal to the difference that is in FP and OO. I don't want you to be scared of design patterns. Not all of them are going to be useful in the functional programming world. Singleton, maybe not. But things like the facade, the bridge, the adapter, those might be useful. If not in your code, maybe at the architectural level. But beware of overuse too. In the OO world, whenever someone learns about design patterns, you pattern all the things. You don't need to do that. Um, I've always liked this comic, uh, the world seen by an object-oriented programmer where your door is a visitor monitor interface and your TV is an entertainment provider singleton. Like, I don't want to see this in an OO or an FP code base. Be aware of pattern fever. Take a, a good look at what you actually think, what is the problem trying to solve, and make and apply that to your functional programming world. 
This is this feels like Java to me of like 10, 15 years ago. I don't know if it's gotten better, but I know that when I was using working Java, like I it's like the border factory get this border interface. Like I just I felt like it was like five design patterns jammed into one function call. Is it still like that or has it gotten better in Java? Any Java people here? And I don't see a lot of enthusiasm on that. Okay. Um, so takeaways of this talk. What do I want you to take away from here? You can take away different things. This is just what I suggest. Why do we have these principles? Why do we have a lot of these object-oriented design principles? To me, a lot of it comes down to maintainability. How do I maintain my code in the long term? I don't think most of these OO design principles are well suited for small projects, hundreds of lines of code. But when you get to like thousands, tens of thousands or millions of lines of code, I, I don't know if many multi-million functional programming code bases, but the point is when you get to large projects, you have to maintain them across time and space. You need to be smart about your dependencies. Anyone who's ever done any like JavaScript development and waited 30 minutes for all the node modules to like come in knows what I'm talking about when like dependency hell happens. You need to be smart about your dependencies and learn how to decouple where appropriate. And a lot of, there's been a lot of talk about that in the OO world. I have not seen as much talk about it in the FP world, but the problem is still there. It's easier to manage, but it's still there. Your program and system has state. It has mutable state. And let me say that even louder. Your program and system have mutable state. Your building blocks may not, but there's very, 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 very few programs that don't require mutable state throughout their lifetime, either in a database, in another service, even if it's just one big old like reduce that takes care of that state on your stack. You have to think about how state is manifesting in your system. It's easier to handle in FP languages. doesn't mean you can ignore it completely. Think about your microservices. Again, your state in your database, your state in each individual microservice. And also remember, this picture can work both for functional programming and object-oriented programming. So don't, don't discount either. Please don't get bogged down in UML. That was, I understand why UML was created. I understand some value to it. And I use some of the like, sequence diagrams I love. But it's really easy to look at like design patterns and design principles from OO and just see this mess of blocks and arrows and say, that's not useful. Think about what they're trying to solve. Ask yourself in your functional programming languages, do I also have to solve these problems? And how do I adapt it? I have found a lot of good literature about that. Learn why the patterns were articulated. The definition of a lot of design patterns were, hey, here's the problem we're trying to solve, and here's a common implementation of how to do it. You don't always have to use that implementation. OO programmers can certainly learn a lot from functional programmers. And I'm asserting vice versa as well. And I hope you guys come to agree with me on that. If not, I'm always welcome to argue some more. Just remember, some people might see a duck, some people might see a rabbit. It's both okay. We're all smart human beings trying to solve problems. Treat each other with respect. Stop having the holy wars. You know, start trying to learn from each other. DevSpace, thank you very much for our sponsors. Without them, we could not have this conference. My name's Pat Biafor, you may follow me on Twitter, I have a blog, I update them with about the same frequency, which is about annually. You can follow me if you want. Are there any questions? Come on guys, I've got 20 minutes of waiting for you guys to have questions. I'm not letting you leave until 3.30. <laughs> nah, I'm not. If you don't have any questions, thank you very much for your time. Do you have a question? Yes. Some people, some people have argued like a monad's a design pattern, and other people say no, that's just category theory applied. Um, I, I don't do enough FP to really say, if anyone in FP knows that there's a design pattern specific to FP, I mean, collection pipelines to me are a, a design pattern in a way of how to organize your code, but you can do those in object-oriented as well. Well, you can do them in object-oriented languages, which makes them look functional, so. The line is so blurry between the two, I, I don't have a good example. Does anyone have an example of like something you really only see in FP? I would argue that design patterns in FP tend to just be patterns. So the category theory that you talk about yeah. monads, that math is what's describing the design patterns. Yeah, and if we look at like a monad, a monad, and I cannot explain monads. For like, well, there's like three, fun, three behaviors a monad has to have. That's the interface of a monad. And there's some invariant about what a monad does. Like, if you pass this to it, this invariant is preserved. That's 
I mean, the, the lines are so blurred there that it's tough for me to say. I will say most of the OO design patterns end up just being a single function or like a dependency injected function, FP. It, that's why I think people say, oh, it's trivial to implement. And a lot of people will lie over, but you should still learn them because they solve a real problem. Dependency injection can be a good thing when used in moderation. Decoupling can be a very good thing when used in moderation. And like a lot of design patterns are solving how do I decouple things, how do I inject dependencies, how do I make this more maintainable for the future? Um, and I'm afraid that that behavior has somewhat stifled like the talk of design patterns in FP. Um, I know I've met a lot of FP people, um, both in person and just observing on the web, who, who as soon as they say design patterns, they throw up their hands and say, don't utter those words around. We are like holier than that for that. I mean, that's why I think it needs to stop. But I feel like that stifled some of the conversation as well. Could, could you consider something like option or either a design pattern? I don't know if I personally would, but I feel like some people could, and I, wouldn't, I don't know if I disagree with them. So a design pattern, when they originally conceived was, hey, I, there's a common problem. Mm -hmm. I need to put some vocabulary around it. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, hey, I need to be able to build objects in a much more sane way. Let's create a builder pattern. Um, there was a reference implementation, which was typically out of, I mean, to some degree, something like how I handle, I want to say um, like an optional or maybe is the design pattern. I would more say the design pattern is handling error types within your type system. Uh, that, that's like a broader category than that, where the maybe and that's optional fair. is the specific implementation of how you achieve that. that, that that's fair. That's fair. So, so Again, the usage of them in your these are all my opinions. It does not mean I'm right. Of course I think I'm right. It doesn't mean it's so. Um, a lot, there are a lot of smart people who agree with me, and there are a lot of smart people who disagree 